You guys didn't hear that, though, did you? <laughs> I got to, oh, I got to uh, do something else first. There's a uh, spirit of power and deliverance in here. There's a special anointing, so I just want to, like, dwell on that in case there's a few of you here that still just need a little maybe a whole lot more breakthrough, a whole lot more freedom and liberty in your life. And what I'm saying this for is those who, of us who have been in control are under the power of something that we couldn't get free up from, it's miserable. But those of us who have experienced Jesus in part or fully know that Jesus came to set the captives free. See, the enemy who will work in your mind will try to hold you by fear or by pride or by many other things of want and lack and all this other stuff will try to hold you in that bondage. But everything that Jesus came to do was to undo the works of the enemy, undo the works of darkness, undo the works of the flesh, overthrow everything that exalts itself against God and bring God's people into a place of liberty, a place of freedom, a place of safety where you don't have to walk around worrying anymore what somebody's going to say about you or what they think about you or what they're going to do to you or a host of other things that you've got to grab on to I got a mental image in my mind right now. Has anybody ever seen the monkey trap? It's a box with bait in it, and they catch monkeys like this, and there's only enough room for the monkey to get his hand through the box into, into where the bait is, and once he gets his hand on the bait, he will allow himself to be captured before he'll release, release the bait because he's got such a greed for that, all he has to do is let it go and pull his hand out. And many of us who have fear of losing things have that mentality, and that thing holds us in bondage when all we have to do is let go and let God. God wants you all to be in freedom. He don't want you to be in bondage to anything. And I'm not just talking about drugs and alcohol and sex and things like that. My goodness, one of the biggest addictions in this world is food. You're in trouble if you do and you're in trouble if you don't. You've got to have it to live, but it can get the best of you sometimes. Believe me. And when you, some of us in here know that after you get over the age of 50, you've got to start worrying about a whole bunch of other stuff they never warned us about. But God wants us to be blessed and eat well, but he also wants us to be in health, physically, mentally, and spiritually. He wants the whole man to prosper in him and have wisdom and common sense. There's a spiritual common sense that can be had by the body of Christ. He doesn't want us to live in fear. Did I say that once already? I think in the last three or four services, it, it, there, this keeps coming up because Jesus is the fear breaker. You see, to be in the presence of God, to be in the presence of Jesus, all fear is gone. Because what he does, he brings faith. And faith is an opposite of fear. Do you know that fear works like faith, but only in the darkness, in the negative sense? That's why this, it says that, uh, th that that which they feared the most came upon them. Because they were so fearful of this thing and they just strained at it that it actually happened to them. It brings in the darkness. It brings in that which could probably normally never have happened, but that fear works against a person, and God doesn't want us to live in fear. He also doesn't want us to live in lack. He wants us to prosper in all things. So, if you're struggling with something, just right where you're sitting, right there, right now, I want you to do something. I don't care what the struggle is. I don't, want, I don't care what the weakness or the shortcoming or anything else because the answer to all of it is the same. His name is Jesus. So I, right there where you're sitting, thinking about that thing that you're struggling against in your own natural man, 
I want you to turn it over to Jesus, and I want you to just do this by faith. You see, when you do it by faith, it echoes in the corridors of the unseen world, and it's heard by God. So I simply want you to call on his name and say this, Jesus. Really? I want you to say this, Jesus. Okay, now if you want, you can stand to your feet and you can say it again. Jesus! 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 All fear is broken in the name of Jesus. All darkness has to go at the name of Jesus. I have salvation in the name of Jesus. I have deliverance in the name of Jesus. Come on, you guys are missing it now. Come on, keep up. Okay, let's go back. Jesus. <laughs> I just had to spend some time on that. You see, Jesus brings the anointing. And the anointing, which is Christ, that's the anointing is the one who liberates, the one who sets free, the one who equips, the one who does that which is impossible. Those things that you were struggling at and there was no possible way to do it or have it or whatever, all of a sudden in the presence of Jesus, it all becomes possible because he brings in the anointing of God and all of a sudden that which was unobtainable is put into your hands. It's put under your feet. You're standing on a firm foundation and the kingdom of God is at hand. It's now available to men and women on planet earth and to have that which was impossible to have before. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Man, I didn't know Jesus did all this for me. I think I'm going to run with it. <laughs> I want to. Huh? Oh, there they are. Remember that one time I was going like, and they were on my head? <laughs> this is the last day of Pastor Appreciation Month. You know that, don't you? <laughs> Somebody pray for those folks over there. The Jesus help them, but wait till I leave. <laughs> Sorry. All right, I want to share a couple things here. Oh, Christ the anointing. I did that. We're going to spend a whole week or two on that. How about that? Because sometimes when you're reading the scripture and you see Christ, you don't know if it means him, his anointing, or us. And sometimes it's one or the other, and sometimes it's all three. You, you guys get that. You hear that. Okay, Romans 13, 7 says, give honor where honor is due. Amen? 1 Peter 2, 17 says, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. And I probably don't do this enough. So, first off, I want to say thank you to uh, the praise and worship team. Because... Amen. <laughs> And I'll tell you what, if I had a lot of money, I'd cut them all a fat check right now. Because not, not because of just the work they do, it's because they're hard after God and bringing his presence in here to us. And I come in here sometimes and I'm tired and I'm run down and everything and sitting in, in praise and worship. 10, 15 minutes, I'm rejuvenated because they're, they're going after him. They're not trying to entertain you and, 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 and just make, give good music to you, but they're bringing the presence of God to you. And that's worthy of honor right there. And the thing is, too, and many of them up on this stage, they do things that you don't have any idea about, uh, like uh, Tammy and John and how far they drive. But they come down on Thursday to do practice and set up and everything, too. And Patrick and Char and all the different things that they do. And Craig, all of them up here, all the things that they're doing, Kevin, and, and, and uh, it, I don't want to start naming names because I don't want to leave people out, but... 
it just goes on and on, all the stuff that they're plugged in and all the things that they do. And then we've got Wayne, we got, we got the sound, we got Lynn back there right now, and Anna has been so faithful. And when you said you might not be here, I went, uh-uh. That's why I sound weird on the phone. I wasn't trying to be insensitive to your little little food poisoning thing going on there. But I'm like, huh? What do you mean? I mean, I was thinking that. I don't know how I sounded on the phone. Because I knew the Lord told me that. So I just kind of like went along with it. But look at there. Look who you are. And, and all the things that Rhonda does and... Never gets a mention many times, but darling, I appreciate you, and I honor you tonight. Amen, huh? Uh, and Sharon, her little sidekick, who she's had in training for a long time, and then there's many that's not even here. They, this is not even their regular church, but during the week, uh, Melanie and, and Veronica and all those who tirelessly serve, and they got another church that they can go to. But yet, when we're out doing the stuff, they're faithful with us, ministering to God's people. And then all the stuff that Patrick and Mark and the team that he has raised up on uh, 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 Sunday in that ministry and with Janet. I mean, she, Janet's got her fingers in all kinds of stuff, and you don't even hear her or see her. Who, probably you're all saying, who's Janet? She's right there. And Craig, as he's always around me, no matter what, usually if I'm out doing something, he's there. Whether he wants to be or not, there's something inside of him that just kind of pushes him along. Nancy's like, you got stuff to do at home, and we got to make some money this week. See, I can hear that. <laughs> Bless him, Lord. <laughs> but I just want to say thank you, and there's many, many names that I have not done, but I, I want to start doing that. I want to start honoring you all. Uh, I appreciate you, Lynn, Sean, and I mean, it's just, it's incredible. Kevin, working the house at Steps along with uh, John and his wife and all that they do, that's <laughs> incredible. My wife and I did that for years, and when John first came to me, God just started talking to me about discipleship program, and I'm like, I can't do that. I don't want to do that again. And then John comes to me, and I'm like, you know how hard this is, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was like this. Like, we was running men's and women's pro, and we was actually living in the house, which we call the Carice House, the House of Grace, up in Reading. And it was out, what, 25 miles out in Bella Vista, out of Reading. Took my wife out there in the middle of nowhere. And in about six months, she goes, Because I left every day to go do interviews at the jail and do intakes and do ministry stuff at the church. And she broke out on, can I share this, a rash on her foot because of her stress and it wouldn't go away and there was no medicine that could cure it. And she said to me, she said, Lonnie, I know the call's on your life and I love you for that. But I didn't sign up for this. This is your deal. So you better talk to God or Bob or somebody. And I'm like, man, this is my free rent. And <laughs> I did. What am I going to do? I'm like almost working for free. And God's meeting all my needs. But like, and so I said, you know what? We need to go to Bethel Church on a Sunday. So we go to Bethel Church over there and. One of, well, actually was my right hand person, and Bob took her away, Debbie Stannard. And we go to the altar to pray about this situation because either I fix this problem or my life, wife is going to leave. So uh, I'm like, I'm at the end of me, and I'm like, God, you need to fix this. And so I, I, I didn't say anything to her like that about that, but I got her to go up to the altar. And I didn't do that too often because I make my altar in my car or my truck or on my especially my motorcycle, that's a nice altar, in the wind, feeling the wind, and the wind, <sighs> but anyway, we, we kneel down at the, the altar there at the, the Bethel Church, and Debbie comes around and gets in front of us, and she says, I know that you guys are out there running that 
Karee's house and everything, but she goes, God has put this in my heart that if you guys need a place to stay, my husband and I will open up our home to you and your children. And we got empty rooms now. Yeah, <laughs> just about. And you know how you have that moment with God? Okay, I heard that. And I said, we'll be there. <laughs> there wasn't no discussing or anything. But anyway, and, and everything went smooth and everything was fine. But uh, I'll tell you, there's things in the ministry that's very difficult, very hard. We went through a lot of stuff in discipleship programs with the men and the women. But there's still, to this day, marvelous testimonies that came out of all of it. And you guys will find that in years to come. You'll still get those. I still get the phone call. I just got a phone call the other day. And uh, uh, this fella, he, he just, he was stubborn. He was older than me. He thought he knew it all. He was raised seven-day Adventist, and he had all the answers, but yet he was in his addiction. And I'm trying to tell him the things that he needs to surrender and what he needs to do. And it's just one of those, when he had the breakthrough, and it wasn't that easy. His wife, she was a big girl. That's when we was in the hood up there in Reading. And she comes and comes out on the street in the daytime. And she says, Lonnie Nix, Reverend, you know that man you're putting up there in the house? He's no good. <laughs> there is no hope for that man. <laughs> oh, I, was, I just hid in the house and said, Jesus. Me and Renee is pretty good friends now. I mean, <laughs> and, and their marriage got healed, and that was an impossibility, you know. And he went back to driving truck, and and it's just amazing those miracles that happen. Uh, and he's one of those that knows two two plus two equals Jesus. But anyway, uh, there is nothing easy about ministry. Yeah, John. Oh, my goodness. Well, we might have to do some different things. I better expedite this thing and move along where I was going to go. I'm just having too much fun. There's just like a special anointing here tonight. Yeah. So, well, welcome. Are they here tonight? Two of them? Well, I don't know who you are, but uh, welcome to church. For real. <laughs> You know, you know that thing you keep feeling on the inside of you, and it's like a, I don't know, it might be spiders running around the side, or it might be a little tickle or anything, and these ideas and thoughts are going through. That's not you! He's so quiet, yet I'm so loud. But when he says it to me, it's loud. So i got to give it loud. That's God, and he'll talk to you. So just say yes to him. And the thing is, he'll say things to you that you'd never say to yourself. You know, I found that out. When I had a $100 bill in my pocket, that's all I had. And this voice said, put that in the offering plate. And I went, devil, I rebuke you. <laughs> and that same voice said, the devil would never tell you to do that. I'm, you know, young Christians with their pampers on, you know. Uh, somebody help us. <laughs> you got it. That's it right there. Oh, man. Now I don't know what I'm going to do. What Patrick was saying about giving, and, you know, I don't, I usually leave it to Patrick. I don't talk a lot about giving. But I, God gave me a word in because I was thinking about the fear being gone and, and, and faith coming and everything. And when you get in the presence of the Lord, guess what happens? Joy comes. Talk about addiction breaker. When you can have it by the fly, naturally from the Spirit of God, above and beyond anything you've ever experienced before. There is a reason why they call him the Most High. Some of you got that. <laughs> I'm a Jesus addict. I can feel it right now flowing through my veins. Woo. 
there's, there's no bad mornings either. It's good morning. It's a new day. All right. Down to business. <laughs> Isaiah 35.10. I'm just going to throw some scripture out since I spent so much, spent so much time just a yakking. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. When you see Zion in the Old Testament, that is the city of God. That is the tabernacle of God. It is the place that houses God's people. So today that would be the church, the people of God. And come to Zion with singing and with everlasting joy on their heads. And they shall obtain gladness or joy and gladness listen to this some of you need a good shot of joy and a little cup of gladness and it'll change your outlook on life and the darkness is going to leave the signs going to come off of you some of you make that noise oh, stop that when you feel the urge to let that sigh out just go jesus it'll change you It'll change you, your family, your household, your neighborhood, your city. Oh, come on, get with me. And the uttermost parts of the earth. You can make a difference if you can get this. Because it says this, and sorrow and sighing, which the mourning or the sighing, shall flee away. In other words, it can't be around you. You know what ransomed is, right? If you ransom something, you go redeem it. You buy it back. That's us. We've been redeemed. We're the ransomed of the Lord. And that's why we got to come with joy. Singing. What's singing? Let's do another one. Nehemiah 8.10. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet. Eat the fat, drink the sweet. You know we have a food ministry in this house, right? <laughs> eat the fat. And drink the sweet. You see, I told you God wants you to have good things. And he wants you to be blessed. He wants you to taste the milk and honey of the land of promise. He wants you to receive the promise. He wants you to live in the promise. When you start living in the promise, you begin to realize that Jesus is that promise. He is the fulfillment of everything God intended for his people. And when Jesus departed from the planet and went to the right hand of the Father, he sent Holy Spirit to reveal all things concerning the Father and the Son. We have been gifted with things that is beyond our comprehension. Do you know, where the Holy Spirit is, there is joy. Where the Holy Spirit is, there is activity in, in the spiritual realm going on. When the Holy Spirit is there, there's happiness and peace and joy and comfort going on. He just doesn't do one thing because for a long time there was a teaching about him being just a paraclete and he just brings us comfort, you know. That's only a teeny, teeny piece. I mean, comfort is important to those who are, have been strung out and knocked around and everything. They need to be comforted. But then the Holy Spirit will lift you up and he'll put you on that place of, of surety on that firm foundation and then he'll begin to instruct you about who jesus is and about what jesus has done and about what you're going to do because of jesus in you and he's going to take that little bit that you offer to him and he's going to magnify it exponentially it's just not plus it's just not times he's going to go exponential with it in you if you can learn to receive the things of the spirit and walk in that power instead of just like oh this feels good I know it makes you feel good, but it's just not there to make you feel good. So Holy Spirit makes me preach good. But it's, he's not here just to make me sound good so that you guys will listen. He's here to turn you inside out and change you from the inside out and empower you to do everything that he called you to do. You are not namby-pamby, pencil neck weenie Christians. You are mighty in him. That's what I was talking about. It's real. It is true. It ain't no good time religion. It's a relationship with God. Coming to our senses and getting out of our pig pens and returning to that place of where we was born to dwell in. That, that, them, them, them places that were, were kings and queens and princesses and, and, and princes. 
to know who you are in the royal bloodline, in the royal family, and not walk with your nose up in the air with an attitude thinking you're better than anybody else, but in the attitude of humility and reaching down as far as you can to lift others up instead of letting them stay there. Because that's what the true spirit of Christ will do in you. You are not willing to leave somebody down when you know they don't have to be. You'll do everything you can to restore them to their rightful position. Ooh. Man, I'm looking at the real ones. You're the people of God. You've got purpose in your life. You have a destiny. And it's not somewhere you're going to get someday. If you can receive this as you journey on this walk in the Spirit, your destiny is already all around you. Because it's the things that you do today and tomorrow and the next day that's going to live on in eternity. In the now, here, this is the time, this is the place to be tested to walk by faith and not by sight. I don't have to see it, I know it by the Spirit. That's faith. Unique, I see you're getting excited in the Spirit. Think about every Friday night that you miss, girl. You need to be here every Friday night. Jesus has a plan for your life, and so do I. <laughs> Something happened, though. It got a hold of you. What did you do? Go home and think about it and then dream about it? Okay. That was my intention. Huh? Yes and amen. Ooh. Mm. Psalm 35, 27. Let them shout for joy and be glad. You got it. It didn't say get joy and shout. It said let them shout for joy and be glad. The best time to shout is when you don't feel like it. The best time to pray is when you don't want to. The best time to get up and do something for the king is when you don't want to do anything for anybody and you just want to lay in that bed and vegetate. That's the time to do it. It's all, How many in here has worked out with weights? Have you ever had those days that you didn't want to do it but because you had disciplined yourself to work out so many times a week and, and put so much time in that you go and you start your sets and every single rep of every set is agony until there is a point where you hit and it's just like boom. And then there's, it's effortless. There's no effort in doing the sets, as a matter of fact, or the reps. As a matter of fact, you think, I'm going to add on six reps and do ten extra sets today. And it'll, it becomes the best workout that you ever had just because you pushed yourself. Sean, have you experienced this yet? If you haven't, I'm going to start working out again. You'll come and, okay. All right. It's good, though. But when you do that in the spiritual realm, it's even better. It's even better. Okay, I'm going to ask you something else, but I don't want anybody to raise your hands or anything. You know that you've, you've been going too long without talking to God. And so finally, and you know what it is to get along and get alone with Jesus and just give him a good old praise and worship service. Don't go with a, a, a list of requests or a petition for things that you need or want even for somebody else, but just to go say, Jesus, I love you. Papa God, I appreciate you and I need you in my life so much. And you just start simply like that, and all of a sudden, it's like, you know, it's nothing like that five-minute prayer that was like, oh, just trying to get through it. You look at the clock and it's an hour later, and the presence of God is there, and you don't care, and you're ready to spend all day because you've got that sweet moment, that sweet time alone, and you're thinking, and see, because the, the brain does something different in it because it's trying to, spiritually, it looks at the, 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 the mental, physical mind and it's like, what's wrong with you? Why have you been resisting this? This is good. Is that just me or is there other? Okay. Am I right? Okay. I like to be right once in a while. 
Let them shout for joy and be glad. Who favor my righteous cause and let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified. Does anybody know what that means? Enlarged. The more you look at and lift up and give honor and praise and worship to the Lord, the larger he will become in your spiritual eyesight to where he is enlarged and he is magnified and he is larger than any of your shortcomings and your downfalls and your fears and your problems. You guys are getting this, right? And pretty soon they just kind of, not only are they in the shadows, they just fade away because he's so much bigger. And when we spend time with him and we begin to experience him and we get to know him, oh, he's a big God. He's a big, big, big God. He is the I am that I am. There's no one like him. He's wonderful and marvelous. Oh, I magnify his name because he's worthy of all praise. I glorify him because there's none like my God. He and he alone is God. You get my drift, right? Who, and this scripture's still going, who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. Remember where this started? It's a shout for joy. A shout for joy because we need to release and it takes us all the way to what God's desire is over His people and He desires us to live in the, in the land of prosperity. He desires us to live in the land of plenty. He desires us to live in the land that is flowing with milk and honey. That's what God has always designed for His people to come into that place. Not just to have a million dollars in your bank account or anything else. It's to be spiritually rich and you will never experience lack. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Let me, let me break that down for you. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall never experience lack. All right? And my tongue shall speak of your righteousness and of your praise. All day long. So the beginning of joy and gladness and peace and even prosperity is when we are willing to come and give it all to Him. Where we're willing to come even when we don't feel like it. Even when we don't want to and surrender it all to Him. And then let it blow up in us. Or let me say that properly. Let Him blow up in us. Because I'll tell you what, God in you is a lot larger than you. Amen? Amen? Okay, so I'm going to parlay that into giving. Proverbs 11:24. There is one who scatters yet increases more, and there is one who withholds more that is right, but it leads to poverty. The hoarding your goods will not make you rich. As a matter of fact, in, in the, on the spiritual side, those who are willing to give it away will never be poor. They will never have lack because the more you give is what's going to come back to you. And you think about scriptures over and over that you can't outgive God. And whatever you share with, if you use a shovel to give, he's going to bring it back to you with a shovel. Okay? If you use uh, one of them big snow shovels, well, let's go back further. You, know, you guys know what a dollar bill is? That's rolled up real tiny. I've never seen $100 bills rolled up like that. I have seen this. Somebody can steal hundreds of dollar bills in a couple once. That was kind of amazing. One of your family members. <laughs> I, said, That's, I thought there was a bunch of ones there, man. <laughs> Pulled it out of my pocket. I almost fell down. <laughs> but that's the heart of a giver, you see. But whatever you bring to, it to God with, as a matter of fact, speaking about your I'm sorry, but I can't leave this. Uh, your family member, Cece, that I think that she was a giver when she couldn't afford to give. It was because of her that now your tribe is blessed beyond measure. It's for women like that who feared God and, and went to the, I know she did this for my brother. She went to get, and I think it was Sandra, her daughter's uh, 
money to get milk and bread and saw my brother and gave the money to him and then then they had no money to get the milk and bread and it wasn't her money but she saw the man of god and gave it to him and the woman became blessed i mean the word of god works and it's true if you do what the word of god says you will be blessed beyond measure that's why i changed all my mailboxes instead of bill boxes or cash boxes now And you know what's amazing? The unexpected ones. And it's just got God written all over it. You know what I mean, Patrick. <clears throat> but if you're generous, oh, I didn't finish that, did I? So, you know, you, know, you guys know what a three-yard bucket is. If you give with a three-yard bucket, that's the way God brings it back to you. I started giving away food, you know, sandwiches, peanut butter sandwiches, and a little brown sack. Then we decided to up the ante and go to food for families, not just the homeless on the street. And I was doing it like, you know, 10 boxes out of the church and 20 boxes I deliver out of the back of my truck. Now we have two box trucks with pallets and thousands of pounds of food hummark every week because we give. Everything that comes in, give it away. What are you going to do? Don't store it? No. Give it away. Well, keep Keep some of that for just in case. Some of it went rancid, just like the manna, you know. Nah, just give it all away because it's going to come back. Even on a short day, even on short days, and we got two hundred and something families, people representing that many families, and we're like, man, we're like, you know, two thousand pounds short today. And what happens? There's food left over. We've told the people that volunteer, you might not get nothing today because we've got to take care of the people who came, you know, because that's our first, first obligation. And that's some of the biggest, some of their best boxes, the volunteers, huh? It's amazing. Because the Word of God is true. And whatever you give. Some of you sitting around with too much time on your hands, I'll bet that you said, well, I'm just going to sow my time. That was a joke, but it like it had lead on it. Or maybe you didn't get it, you know, you, because you reap what you sow. That's why you got more time on your hands. Oh, yeah, never mind. <laughs> Verse 25, it says, The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. Proverbs 22, 9. He who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. Oh, man. Generosity. There's nothing like it. And generosity will give you that, that freedom and that peace and that joy. I can't tell you how much it means to me to see someone light up that kid, uh, Jake's son, I love, I love pocket knives. And so if I give someone a pocket knife, it means I think a lot of them, especially if I give them one of my favorites, like a Kershaw or something like that. And I had a collector knife, and I, gave, I pulled out a nice organ pick buck, a collector, and I pulled out this other collector that with bone in it and everything, and I was going to let him, which was a custom handmade knife, no brand name, and so I took, to, uh, took it to Jake's son, because I heard he liked knives, and I said, your pick. And he's like, whoo, really? And he grabbed the handmade one. <laughs> and he danced around the parking lot. We was over at the Marriott. And he danced around, and he went and showed everybody that knife. Look, look what Lonnie gave me. He went over to Zeb even, and Zeb's like, Yep, and looked at his kershaw I gave him. <laughs> but it does my heart. I love to give because there's nothing like giving. I think it was. I think it was Jesus. Wait a minute, I might have it here. Oh no, I don't have it here. But he said that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Because You know why Jesus knew that? Because he was born to give. He came into this world to give. 
The whole kingdom principle is based upon the giving. And God so loved the world that He gave. And He just didn't give anything. He gave His only begotten Son. Think about that. Just because of the purpose of giving and loving, it blows up. And think about the one who was... He didn't have any natural children on planet Earth. Jesus Christ was the one who was barren with children, but he who is, was barren now has more children than they all. That's powerful. And it's in the giving. Did you guys get that? Hebrews thirteen sixteen. Do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices... God is well pleased. I got five minutes. Why don't I just read another portion of scripture? Second Corinthians nine six, and I love to use the Apostle Paul's, you know, scripture on giving because these were letters that he wrote to people and his experiences with them, and whether you guys know it or not, there's whole chapters in the Bible about giving. Uh, to to more correctly, before I read this. Answer one thing: Is it, is it a must? How did you say that? What was that word you used to give? Is it mandatory to give? Well, you want me, you want the right answer instead of a bunch of religious fooey and hogwash. Actually, there's two different types of tithe and offering in the scripture. Under the Levitical tribe, it was the law that they gave, and they had to give ten percent tithe, and they could not get to the uh, uh, offerings until they had completed the tithe because everything up to 10% of their income was tithe. And then the offerings was after that. And then they had a, a ton of other uh, offerings that were sacrificial. In other words, you, you know what sacrifice is? Give until it hurts. Give until, and you know you, you can't do it, but yet you do it because you're compelled by the spirit. Not stupidity, not some man talking you out of something and being conned. Because I don't like that, and I watch it on TV and a lot of other things. That's why I never offered you olive oil from Israel to give your offering. I'll pray for you, and I'll give you an anointed hanky, and you just lay it on the sore spot, but you got to, for this hanky, you send in 125 bucks. You know what? The email, I just delete them when they come in. All right. Anyway. And those of you watching by live stream, wise up. And go to the PayPal right now and send in that money. And if you go to another church, you better send your tithe there first. Right? <laughs> Sorry. This is good, though. You've got to admit. <laughs> okay. So the Levitical is the, by law. Okay, but let's go back before the Levitical and his father, Abraham. And coming back from the wars, he ran into one called Melchizedek, which was the type of Christ. And when Abraham, the latter, seen the greater, he came and gave him the spoils or the tithe of the spoils of war and paid his tithe to this one Melchizedek. Wait a minute. He's the father of the Levitical priesthood that would come, that would require tithe, and yet he paid tithe to another. Why? Because that was representative of the Christ. There is no barrier. There is no law. And by the way, Jesus broke the law when he hung on the tree, and so it's not the confinement of the law of tithe because here it is. And I, and I, and I know people, and I've had people give to this ministry that are confined to that, I appreciate them because they're consistent. But the thing is, I get these checks, $332.14. And then the next time it came in, it would be the exact same in 14 cents. It means they were given what they were required to give by law. It's like the salt shaker and the great man of God who said he would go like this with a salt shaker. And everybody knows they don't put big enough holes on salt shakers, if you're like me and like salt. And he would do the salt, and he would go, tither, 
And his family goes, what do you call the salt shaker tither? He goes, it only gives what it has to. <laughs> now, listen, I'm not clowning if you ain't tithing yet. The thing is, it's a starting point to try to get to because it's probably going to be a sacrifice to get to your 10%. But we're not under law. But the thing is, once you get this and you begin to experience kingdom living, the dynamics of kingdom, somebody says, am I required to tithe? Listen, as a giver, I have to because I can't afford not to give. I have come to a place in God and that I know how the hand of God moves when we are obedient to His Word. He is obedient to us. The Word of God doesn't fail. God doesn't fail because He backs His Word. It is impossible for God to lie. And if you do what He says, you will be blessed. Has any of you ever heard me preach a sermon like this before? In all the years that... But here's what God told me. Listen, you do them a disservice if you don't do this once in a while and tell them the truth about tithing. So you guys got the part about, see, the, the type of Christ encompasses the old thing. We're no longer under law, that Levitical priesthood. And, and you can't be no more saved whether you tithe or you don't tithe. You just, if, but if you give in the offerings and you do what God tells you to do, and, and I wouldn't spend too much time praying about it because you'll end up giving more than what you was going to give in the first place. Oh, go ahead and fast about it then and pray and see what happens. <laughs> the thing is, you can't get no more saved, but you will be more blessed if you're obedient to God's word. I mean, really, do you believe God? Do you believe his word? Do you believe it's real? Then why not us just do what it says? And you might be in that place where I don't have a job? Okay. Uh, do you find pennies on the ground? Why don't you just go ahead and do this? Everything that you see on the ground is seed. Because you didn't earn it. You found it. The Bible says that God gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So if you find that seed, pick it up. And if you start at pennies, see what God will do. And if he'll give seed to the sower... Everybody in this house, you might not be a sower yet, but you're an eater. But what if you come to the place of kingdom living in that dynamics of seed and bread that you begin to sow those pennies and nickels and dimes and quarters or whatever you find on the ground and once in a while, walking through the parking lot, here comes a 20, walk over by the fence line when, on a windy day and there's all kinds of stuff bloated. Hey, I've done this. I have paid bills by sowing pennies. I bought a Harley Davidson with pennies. And obedience to God's word. I counted up my change and I had 500 bucks. And he goes, well, how much more do you need? And I said, I need at least a couple more grand. Well, that week, that weekend, we had a guest preacher in town over at somebody's church. And one of those people handed me 10,000. I mean, 2,000. Not 10,000. 2,000. No, she handed me 1,000. And then the evangelist walks out as I was driving away. My wife's sitting there next to me in my little truck. And now I've got 1,500 for the down payment on my Harley. But I needed 25. He runs out and he goes, whoa, 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 where are you going? I didn't know you was going to leave. We were eating at the Denny's down there in Newcastle. And he reaches in his pocket, and people just always walk up to him and hand him money. And, oh, I take it back, wadded up, dollar bills. Well, these were all wadded up. And he, like, starts emptying his pocket and dumping it all in on my lap, and it's all wadded up. I think he wads it up. When they'd hand it to him, he'd just wad it up and stick it in his pocket. And there was ten little balls of money, and we unrolled it. And she goes, what are they? We're sitting there in the dark still in the parking lot. We can't even leave now. You know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one hundred dollar bills in one day on the weekend. So guess where we were at Monday? Was it closed that day or something? We had to go back? Anyway. Broom. Broom. <laughs> you know, if I really tried to do all the scriptures tonight that I wanted to do, we'll be here till ten o'clock. 
Uh, you guys want a little grace? We got a big outreach tomorrow. Who's coming? Okay, let me, let, let me say this. But I say this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he proposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And this is the Apostle Paul to the New Testament church telling you who sh- how you should give because he who gives or she who gives is those who prepare to give. How many people have left your wallet at home or whatever, the money clip with the money in it because you were going to church? You're not prepared, so you're not going to give. So you're not going to re- reap the b- b- bountiful blessings of God. You might have all you need, but why don't you want to walk in spiritual blessing? Spiritual blessing is much better than being Donald Trump. Wow, it got quiet. Oh, he's one of those guys running for president now. Heesh. Having money is not the answer. Walking in God's prosperity is because his prosperity doesn't come like worldly gain. It comes with cheerfulness. It comes with joy. It comes with happiness. It comes from being obedient. It comes from doing the right thing. And you'll lay down and sleep at night and wake up the next morning and feel good. Somebody say feel good. I like to feel good. Well, then be obedient. And actually what he does, he will make sure that you have plenty for every good work. You know, the amazing thing is everything that we do costs money. Just think if we had lots of money. Anyway, enough said about money because what we have is more valuable. And if you taste the, the reaping of the benefits of sowing into God's kingdom, you'll never stop. And the thing is, it is borne out in the relationship. It's, it's great to be a tither, and it's great to be a giver, okay, because givers give. But I think there's, there's one level that will outdo it all, and it's a lover. If we love someone, I'll do anything for this woman right here because I love her. Even if I don't want to, and I get upset at her, and I still end up doing it anyway. I'm like, what's wrong with me? It's love. Because I love her, and I love God. There's times when he said something to me, and I'm like, mm, that hurt. But then when I did it, it's like, oh, oh, thank you, God. And he's like, see, I told you. <laughs> and then he shocks you and amazes you, and he blesses you, and it's And it's just incredible to have that kind of experience. And he will equip you and prepare you for everything in life. And believe me, the older I get, I want to be prepared for what's around the corner. There's things that happen in my life, and it just shows me in the natural just how fragile our lives can be and how something can be taken away from us so quickly. And I just want to be thankful to God for everything I have, and I want to be prepared for what's ever around that next corner And that's why I'm going to be obedient in all things to God. All right, God bless you. There's communion here, but I'm going to do something else. If if you're out there and you have no clue what I was talking about, but you liked what you heard, and there's something inside you wanting to step more into this kingdom I'm talking about, just raise your hand with all eyes open and everybody looking around. Raise your hand. Okay? All right, all right, all right, okay, all right, okay, that's enough. I see your hand back there. (laughs) Pray this, Jesus, I believe, I believe what this preacher said. I believe that you came and gave everything just for me. So that I might have life, that I might have liberty, and that I might know you. Come into my heart, bring Holy Spirit, and imbibe me with your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, you did that from the heart, you confessed it with your mouth. It's done. You're in. Welcome to the family.
<laughs> the Lord's table is set. Come and have communion.